This morning we have two scripture readings. The first is taken from the New Revised Standard Version in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave for all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The second reading is also from the New Revised Standard Version. It's taken from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to the beginning of uh, verse 3. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, I do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Clyde, again. I'm wondering how many of you can remember the last time somebody saved you, even in a small way. I have had has to depend on a lot of people. As I was a university student, I had a bad leg, bad knee, bad foot, and some people saved me. They were able to get me to work. They picked me up and took me home. There are times recently when I was sitting at a red light and it turns green and you go to pull out and sue. You ever had that happen? And you say, thank you. Thank God, someone could have just taken me out, but by God's grace. And hopefully by God's grace, we want to, we want to the person not paying attention and went through the red light. If we were to look over our weekly schedule, my guess is there is a lot of times we could thank God for someone who came into our life at just the right moment. And yet we don't take enough time to just thank God for redeeming us. When he says this word today, don't be afraid, I am with you. Don't be afraid, I'm with you. While I want to thank all the people who have helped me in life, 
We need to remember God. We need to be thankful. There are times in our history we forget the God who has redeemed us. The year was 722 before Christ. The people of the north of Syria came down, took the people of Israel out of their land in Babylonia and enslaved them. And God says, don't worry, I'm coming for you. I'm going to send my people free. Have you ever been down and out when you wondered how you are going to go on for sometimes generations, health, money, all kinds of issues, relational issues? Sometimes we wonder how to overcome and we live in fear. And we get in bondage for fear. And we don't know what to do. And God says, I'm with you. I will not forget you. There are several places around the world where there are statues of the Christ, the Redeemer. We are redeemed daily by our. If I had to look at how many times my parents redeemed me, oof, the list is long. They pick me up through failures and through mistakes, errors in life. And how much more Christ had to pick me up and has picked you up if we become aware of God's goodness in our life. So what is it that we are afraid of? It can be the roller coaster of life. It's not always easy. Childbirth is wonderful, but it can be difficult different difficulty. Um, There are those things with our finances that we are looking forward to a nice comfortable retirement and the market crashes and we get worried about where we will we go and will will be comfortable and the least of what we are afraid of. I'm not even talking of the things like fear of dark or fear of water, fear of flying. And God says to all these things, have not always been there for you. Will I not always be there? Sometimes through your friends, family, acquaintance, sometimes through strangers. But I'm your God. I will redeem you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Let us read Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 to 3. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not send you of rage, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. And it's not sort of like I own you, I own you. It's I'm here for you. I love you. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. It is a term of endearment when God says, I love you, my children, you are mine. The fears are many and God says, whenever you are looking and sometimes we look so far off that we think, Wow, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know where I want to go. I don't know, I don't know what I want to be. And God says, slow down wherever you go. However far the distance, I will go the distance with you. I'm your God. Even in the storms and the raising seas, I'm your God. 
I will be with you if you truly want to rely on me in your mind, heart, and behavior. As I often mention to my children, I found God in my mind. I find God in my places. When I know I'm all alone, I have to envision God and embrace me as my mother, father, or people I know who have cared for me that I know I will find comfort. When I lose the people I love, when I'm disappointed with life, when things don't go my way, I have to find the comfort of God saying, you will be okay. Hear those words, you will be okay. You will get through it. Otherwise, we become enslaved become bound up and not free at all to enjoy the gift of life. We have a lot of symbols that we use for Christian faith. Cross, anchors, all kinds of butterflies. I don't know why it should be butterfly, but sometimes we are not anchored enough. The ships that go out into the ocean, even if you are in a small boat and you don't have an anchor, you are not going to say feel secure if your rapid waters come. You have to have something to keep you secure. And I think it's found in Jesus Christ. This week, I read a story. It was from St. Anthony, who is one of the desert fathers and is known as the, he is known as the father of Christian monks. And each a read, each a reading that gave me whole mix of emotions. It's a Saint Anthony speaking to a blind man who spoke to him. He says these words. A blind man asked, can there be anything worse than losing your eyesight? Anthony replied, yes, losing your vision. I was so excited when I thought that. I read that and I thought, vision. You have to have a vision. Where am I going? What do I want? Where I'm going? In elementary school, we already start asking children, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm still looking for that, right? Because it can change throughout life. Where is your vision today? I think we, in this very affluent society, a vision is often stuck on career, where we can make good money, live in a comfortable home, live life big, because most of most of live very big lives compared to the rest of the world. We live in all of our comfort, talk about our vacations, talk about our retirement, so we can get ready and die. Good Lord, there is got to be more, right? A vision is what can I do as an instrument of God? You see, we are not here for our comfort. God did not give us life just so we could have a good time, good old time and have a party and die. God gave us life that firstly, we are to glorify God. It's okay to have fun on the way. Again, it's okay to have fun on the way, but what is your purpose in this kingdom for almighty God? What is it? Have we lost your vision or is it time today to say, Lord, I need to talk to you again. What is it that you will help me with the gifts you have given me? Because all of us are as different as the fingerprint we have to find out what it is that God has for us. We have been unfaithful as the people of God. I'm not talking Calvary. I'm, I'm talking people who identify themselves as Christians in a nation that would like to call themselves Christian is anything but. Let's be honest, anything but. 
we are a broken people. We are probably one of the most affluent people of the world. And we are so caught up in sports and entertainment, which is will I, will our money and our time and our pleasures and even our teaching to our children go, that we forget to teach about Christ. We become generation after generation after generation of people who don't know we have a redeemer, who don't know that we have been redeemed, who don't know that we need a savior, who don't know that we have someone who will always be with us. Now there is nothing wrong with caring for our elderly and the poor, the ailing, the imprisoned, the children, the orphans. We are called to all of that. But you see, we are called to much more than that. The world can feed, but if we only look at temporal needs, most of this is temporal, 100 years, 100 years or less, right? So we feed the food pantry, which we are supposed to to and should all to do, but if we don't offer Christ, if we don't offer a vision practically and socially, if we don't offer people hope in prison, if we don't offer to the dying hope in Christ, what have we given them? Eventually, nothing. The vision of the people of God is to bring the kingdom of heaven upon earth. So we are getting a lot of well-fed people, a lot of people we who are cared for, a lot of people who have their physical earthly needs met, but they are starving for life. The problem in our culture is we are so absorbed into all these wonderful things, but they are not giving life. They are running on empty. They are looking for things in the wrong places. I think there is a country song about that, right? All the wrong places, they are running on empty. A senior minister I used to work with always reminded me, Thomas, you're always so running around busy, sort of like a chicken with a head cut off thin. There are many things to do, but you must choose what is the most important. I'm not saying sports are bad. I'm a gym person, as you know. I'm not saying entertainment. I really wa love watching soccer. I'm saying there is something better than needs to be priority. It's called the kingdom of God. Everything we do ought to be in some sort of a moderation that there is always the premier. The number one is Christ. Because if we don't choose God first and we put God at the end of the list, God dissipates from our life, from our culture, from our families, and all of a sudden it is gone. If I were to look at a lot of families today between the cell phones and gadgets we have, there is very little time for God, to read God, to pray for God, to study God's word, to get to know what it is to be a part of the kingdom. And the world, as it is thinking, needs someone to throw the life preserver. We need salvation. We need a personal relationship with the high, most high God. You remember a story about a guy that got in trouble with the water and whale? Yes, Jonah. It is a story to teach that we don't always go where we want. God wanted him to go to Nineveh and he wanted to go to Tarshish because he wanted those people to go to hell. He didn't like them. And God says, that's not my plan. You are going to go when I send you. The story in there is that you don't always get what you want. There are a lot of stories in there and sometimes you have to go, well, I send you and you have the power. 
Do you know what happened when he started crying out in 40 days change? What, what else and guess what? The whole nation, Nineveh, changed. 40 days, the nation changed. Ever hear of a man named Job? Had everything, lost everything, covered with boils. His friends are asking, what in the world did he do to make God this mad? And even his wife came out to her husband and said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? With great wisdom, he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What does he mean? He, God owes me nothing, nothing, but he trusted almighty God. We are living in a world that is explosive, more in this country, I think, than anywhere. Our culture is imploding on itself with the hatred and the violence. You turn on the news, kidnap kidnappings, murders, drugs, protesters, and it's always been there. But it's becoming so epidemic that we need to do something and the answer isn't one more war on something. The answer is what? The answer is not more taxes, dollars. The answer is Jesus Christ. But you and I cannot be the little church mice who are silent any, any longer. We might teach our children and grandchildren, family members, when we ask, where are they? It's not up to us as leaders alone to bring them. We must never nag our folks. No one likes to be bugged that way, but with loving care, invite and encourage and teach it to bring God's people to their knees in some ways. I really don't care where they worship as long as they come to the living God. It doesn't have to be here, but culture needs Christ in the world today. We need to talk to God. We need to talk with God. We need to be in conversation that others can understand that it's okay to bring angry, to be angry at God when things go wrong. It's okay to ask God questions. Our God is a real conversational God. If we are willing, we need to have those encounters. I'm not sure when the last time you had that encounter for you, I grew up in a day when people would say, well, when were you saved? Wow. Well, June 24, 1935, even I was not born yet. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm asking, are you seeking God daily and saying, God, what is it today that you will have me? Is there someone I could pray for? Is there someone I could visit? Is there someone in prison or hospital or shelter or homebound? Ebenezer brothers and sisters, when we build that relationship, we will be right where God wants us, right in the palm of God. The important thing is that those questions or this relationship is where true stewardship begins from. You see, one of the words we are not good at is submitting ourselves to God, making ourselves available as an instrument of God's peace because we think we own our lives. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. God is not asking most of us to die, die for him. 
No. The question is, could you we live for Christ? Could we live for Christ? Life is a gift from God, and we ought to do all that we can. We can still have fun. We can still have fun. We can still have a good life and serve God at the same time. For God says, don't fear things, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. I love you. I embrace you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, as you need to follow me, want to rely on me in your heart, mind, and behavior, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire because of me, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you on fire. For I, the Lord, am the Holy One to Israel, your Savior. How will they know? Only if we tell. Only if we are not tied to repeat and we go and tell them the good news. The old hymn I love. In the dark of the midnight that I often hid my face, while the storm howls above me, there is not hiding place. May the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry. Keep my safe till the storm passes by, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of your hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. God wants to do that. And that's where our stewardship begins from. Again, our stewardship originated from this reality. What reality? Yes, God is with us. Albert. Schweitzer once put it this way. He, God comes to us as one unknown, without a name as of old by the lakeside. He came to those who knew him not. He speak to us the same word, follow me, and set us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands us, and to those who obey him. Whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils. The conflict, the sufferings, which they shall pass through in his fellowship and as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. God is with us. I don't know your storms, what kind of troubles you have, but God is saying, you are fine. I will use your right where you are today. God needs you and God needs all of us to have a vision of where it is God can use you. We are all equipped for what God needs us and we are blessed beyond the measure to bring the kingdom of God on earth. God is with his children. Stewardship is to be with Christ in all aspects. Why? Because God is with us. So we continue on down this path together and belonging to one another and to him and to all God's children in our lives, being the hope in whatever circumstance we find, find ourselves with whomever God puts in our path. And may we pray that when Jesus asks us, what do you want me to do for you? To have the grace and courage to respond, Lord, 
bid us come and follow you. Let us gather vision and let's do it. Everyone say, Amen.